Welcome to Business Done Differently, the podcast about challenging the status quo, creating fans first, and changing the game in business. I'm your host, Jesse Cole, and it's showtime. Our guest today is Joe Vitale. Joe has done it all, written 75 books, been in 15 movies, recorded 15 albums, and has traveled the world speaking. I know Joe simply as the man who introduced me to the promotional power of B.T. Barnum. His book, There's a Customer Born Every Minute, changed the game for myself, our teams, and how we've created tension throughout the years. Today, I'm so excited to talk P.T. Barnum with Joe Batali. Joe, it's great to connect and have you on the show, my friend. Well, you know what? You got my attention when you sent me a pair of underwear. <laughs> yes, you're, you're holding Nobody, up the Nobody's ever underwear. sent me underwear. <laughs> And, and especially you know, such unique Barnum S. P.T. Barnum would love it. P.T. Barnum would love you. You are doing it, man. All businesses show business, and you're showing it and getting attention. Thank you again for my underwear. All right, thank you. Well, you said in your book, you said you don't need to be in the entertainment business to make your business more entertaining. And that's what we thought. You know, hey, every team sells T-shirts, they sell hats. We started selling Dolce & Banana underwear, and we sent it out to people, and it's become a big hit. So I'm glad. I don't know if you've tried it on yet, Joe, but it is a little ridiculous. I didn't know if I should put it over my head or if I'm supposed to put it over my legs. So, uh, <laughs> no, I didn't try it on. <laughs> but I have looked at it. I have admired it. I, have, I think you saw I posted on Instagram yes. or somewhere. Uh, you had sent it to me. Well done and congratulations to you. Well, thank you very much. And I think we both have a huge love and almost, I would say, an obsession of P.T. Barnum. And obviously, what you've done in your career, you've used a lot of the techniques. And I mean, curious, where did it come from? Where did this intrigue on P.T. Barnum? Because not many people are talking about, until The Greatest Showman came out, about this man in the 1800s. Well, what they need to realize is that he's been dead since 1891, and virtually everybody still knows his name, and they know what he stood for. Then you have to ask yourself, why? Why? Why do we know it? And we know it because P.T. Barnum Barnumized himself. He Barnumized himself. He did big things in a big way, but to the extent that we're still talking about him today. As for me, I was intrigued by Harry Houdini when I was a kid. And I didn't know it at the time, but Harry Houdini was a disciple of P.T. Barnum. He collected P.T. Barnum. He had a vast fortune of P.T. Barnum-related outrageous marketing stuff. And if you know anything about Houdini, he was a Barnum. Houdini is probably the most well-known, greatest legend in terms of magic, but he wasn't that great of a magician. He was better as a marketer. He said he was the handcuff king, which was labeling himself in an outrageous way. He said, lock me up in anything and I'll get out of it which is a very P.T. Barnum-like thing to do. It's a challenge. And so I was intrigued with those kind of antics when I was a kid. But it wasn't until I read P.T. Barnum's autobiography that I went, oh, my God, who was this guy? He was an author. He was a speaker. He was a philanthropist. He was a politician. He was a marketer. He was an entrepreneur. So he lottery was, tickets, not he did it all. Publishes. Yeah. It goes on. And so you read all that and you were like, all right, what can we learn from him? Because I think, and that's, you're like, all right, there's some great lessons here. And is that what you just get you into this, you know, deep dive into his life? Absolutely. Because when I was discovering him, it was probably in the mid 1990s. And at that point I was becoming known as a marketer. I was a copywriter. I was doing a lot of marketing and I saw that, well, everybody's doing copywriting and everybody's doing marketing and everybody's in business. How do you stand out from the crowd? And then I discover P.T. Barnum and all of his outrageous methods, which were really humorous, entertaining, educational. There were positive benefits to what he was doing. And so I started taking that in and applying it to my own life. I invented hypnotic writing and wrote a book called Hypnotic Writing as a P.T. Barnum-like way to separate myself from all the other freaking writers out there <laughs> and all the copywriters and all the writing books. It's like, well, how am I different? Well, hypnotic writing, which was my spin, which was very P.T. Barnum inspired. I also realized that my first book was 1984. And it came and went because nobody did any marketing and I didn't know anything about marketing. That's when I discovered if I want to be known as an author, if I want to sell my books, I've got to do something to stand out in the crowd. I've got to do something. I've got to put on my yellow hat, so to speak. <laughs> I got to do something to make myself different from everybody else. Not necessarily better, but different. Yes. I have to get attention. 
And that's what I was learning from Houdini. That's what I was learning from P.T. Barnum. That's what I was applying to myself. And that's what I started applying to my clients. So Barnum, I can talk about Barnum all day and I can critique the movies that are out there about him. There have been numerous movies. And besides the one that came out with Hugh Jackman. Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll get into, I think what you really shared, what every business can do with the 10 rings of power. But just, you know, personally, as I shared with you, like we had to catapult ourselves to get attention or we were nothing. We were five years ago, we sold two tickets in our first three months. We were down to our last dollar sleeping on an airbed. And we thought, all right, what would Barnum do? And again, as I've read all his books and yours, I mean, literally every page is almost bookmarked in this thing. I said, all right, how do we go dramatically different? And so we not only named the team after a fruit and became the Savannah Bananas, but we said, all right, can we actually have a senior citizen dance team called the Banana Nanas? Can we have a male cheerleading team called the Mananas? That's the dad bod cheerleading squad. And with your attention getting techniques, how can we hire other entertainers? Can we have a break dancing first base coach, dancing players? Can we bring in animals? And we brought a bat dog that was this little cute bat, bat dog. We followed all these techniques. And all of a sudden, we offered President Obama an internship when his term was over as a president. And we started looking, what would Barnum do in this situation? And all of a sudden, everybody started talking. And it became number one trending on Twitter. And it sold out. And it was all these techniques. But Joe, here's my challenge here. There's thousands of books on marketing, but how many books on attention? And that is what P.T. Barnum generated. And I want to go into this because you said that's number one rule that they have to do is you got to create attention first. So maybe go back a little bit and help me with this principle because how did P.T. Barnum start doing this? How did he learn and how did you start doing it? Well, there's a principle in advertising that goes all the way back to the 1800s and it's the IDA formula, A-I-D-A. And a lot of copywriters still use it today. The A stands for attention. So nothing happens, nothing, no sale, no anything, unless you get attention. So whether you're writing an ad, you're writing a sales letter, you're putting up a website these days, unless you get attention, who cares about anything else? So the A is for attention. Then the I is for interest. You have to generate their interest. The D is for desire. And the A is for action. But out of all of those, and the thing that I really drum and stand on soapboxes about and and really want people to get is unless you get people's attention, there is no sale, there is no conversation, there is no follow-up, no sequel, there is nothing. So it's all about attention. P.T. Barnum learned this as a kid. He inherited a store that had nothing but glass bottles in it. And one of the very first things he did was hold a lottery. Lotteries were legal then, lotteries were popular then, and what people won was more glass bottles, but it was his way of getting glass bottles out. By having a lottery, he learned early on that attention was what made a difference no matter what the business was. In his autobiography, he said things like he wanted to shoot fireworks into the air in order to bring attention to what he was doing. When he got his American Museum in the 1800s, which ended up being like the Disney World of that time in New York City, He hung flags on the outside. He put spotlights on the outside. He had a band on the outside that was horrible. And he wanted it to be horrible to drive people inside. And all of this crazy stuff and so many other things he did. Another story that comes to mind is somebody came to him and asked for work. And P.T. Barnum just looked at him and said, okay, I will pay you a dollar, whatever it was, for the day. He says, what I want you to do is go outside and take these 10 bricks. And I want you to lay them right down in front of the building, one beside each other, leading across the street. And then when you get across the street, pick up the bricks and lay them back <laughs> going across the street to the museum. And even I, when I read this, went, what kind of crazy nonsense is this? He's paying a guy to lay bricks and then picking them up. But it got attention. People walking around in downtown New York City are looking like, what's the guy doing with the bricks? <laughs> It's similar to when you stand in the street and you look in the sky. Other people around you are going to start looking in the sky. So there's these very simple things. And of course, Barnum ended up doing, if anybody knows him, giant things like buying Jumbo the elephant from England. And why did he bring him over here? To get attention. At one point, P.T. Barnum had elephants plowing his home property. Plowing his home property as if they were farm animals. Why was he doing it? Because his house was by the railroad tracks that took people into New York City, which is where his museum was. He knew people would look out the window, grab their attention, they'd see an elephant 
plowing the land and they'd go, what is that? And then the conversation would be, oh, that's Barnum. Who's Barnum? He's the guy with the museum in New York City. Oh, yeah, let's go on over there. I can go on. It's the whole idea that Barnum learned early and did it throughout his life that nothing happens without attention. And this serves for you. It serves for me. And I, I'll pause for a moment. <laughs> it's fascinating, too. You know, when I heard the story about Jenny Lind and how he hired numerous reporters to write stories about her without ever hearing her sing just to create the publicity. So when she showed up, 40,000 people would be waiting for her. It's a brilliant launch campaign that no one was doing in the 1900s, let alone in the 1800s. Right. You know, what I'm often asked about marketing, and I will tell people the number one underused technique for all businesses, and this is for everybody that's watching, listening, wherever they're at right now, whatever their business is, is something I learned from Barnum. When P.T. Barnum was on his deathbed, his deathbed, five days before he died, he said he owed his fortune to the newspapers of the United States. And what he was referring to was publicity. Today, of course, we have more than newspapers. In fact, it's overwhelming how many opportunities and avenues and media and social media, and it just goes on forever, that we have. But most people don't think that media is starving for a good story. They want a good story. And this is what P.T. Barnum was saying. He would feed them stories, whether it was Jenny Lynn or the little boy. One of my favorite stories is the little boy who would not grow. Little boy in Connecticut. Everybody knew about the sad story about the little boy who wouldn't grow. And P.T. Barnum meets little Charlie Stratton. And little Charlie Stratton is young at that point. He's a kid. He's only three feet tall. But everybody said, he's not going to get any taller. He's a dwarf. He's, that's it. P.T. Barnum looks at him and sees a superstar and creates a celebrity out of a little kid and names him General Tom Thumb. And then, of course, feeds the newspapers of the day these stories, and then, of course, starts training General Tom Thumb how to sing, how to dance. My God, General Tom Thumb became a multimillionaire. Of course, we still know who he is today. We know the name if we don't know the whole story. So Barnum knew all of this about getting attention, about telling people his story, and we all have stories. Everybody has a story in business. It doesn't have to be a zany, elaborate, colorful, outrageous story, but there's always a story. Yeah. Sometimes it's simply why you got in business. Yeah. What was the turning point? Or sometimes it's about your employees. Yeah, it's so good. You, know, you mentioned a few things which you talk about your 10 rings of power, you know, feed the monster, which we can get into a little bit as far as the media. But you made me think, I mean, General Tom Thumb wasn't really anything. He was just a young boy that wasn't growing and he repositioned it and turned it into contention. And I think about, Joe, when we started, we had a product that we knew would be very attractive. We made every single ticket at our stadium all inclusive. So every ticket, you get all of your food, everything. We are going to have our whole entertainment plan. But as we were shouting that, we didn't have a name yet. People didn't know who we were. It wasn't positioned in a way to then get the attention. And so this launch campaign that I think that the way when to use these attention techniques to launch, that's what P.T. Barnum really did very, very well. And maybe if you can share Maybe not PT, but also some other companies that have said, you know what, we're going to use this attention technique because everyone knows they get attention, but no one knows what does that mean? How do you do it? Right. Well, let me give you a personal example. I don't know if your audience knows me beyond my PT Barnum book. I've written, as you said, 75 some books. So they're in a wide variety of areas. And I was in the movie The Secret in 2006. So there's the whole self help community, law of attraction community. So I really have a foot in both worlds. Some people know me as the marketer, P.T. Barnum scholar. Some people know me as the secret law of attraction self-help teacher. And about seven years ago, I decided that I wanted to be a musician. And you referenced in the bio that I have 15 albums out. Well, I started with nothing. At the age of 60, seven years ago, I said it was on my bucket list to be a musician. And so I jumped in. I jumped in and said, all right, I'm going to record music. And then I started as a good marketer to look around and see what my competition was. And I'm chuckling because the freaking competition is crushing. There's like 3,000 new CDs or at least new albums every week. 3,000 every week. And here I am, you know, a guy with no musical experience, no musical training, no musical background, no musical notoriety going, I'm making music. Why don't you go buy my album? <laughs> 
Good luck. <laughs> so I have to think like P.T. Barnum. I'm thinking, okay, how do I do this? Because the average musician, they're like the average author. They come and go. Nobody ever noticed they existed. Maybe their immediate family bought the book or bought the music, but that was it. And so I had to look at my background. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm known as a self-help guy. And the songs I'm writing are kind of in the self-help area. So why don't I just call myself a self-help singer-songwriter? And then I went and searched to see if there were any out there. And I didn't see anybody calling themselves a self-help singer-songwriter. And I thought, I'm going to own it. I'm going to own it. Now, I'm saying this is a teaching story for everybody watching, because I looked at myself, I took a close look in the mirror to go, okay, who am I? What am I known for? What am I trying to do to get attention? And how can I make a link that makes sense? A link that was logical. If somebody looked at it and go, well, he is the self-help guy. He was in the movie, The Secret. Now he's a musician applying the same principles to songs. And so I listed myself as the world's first self-help singer songwriter. And then I did the technique I was telling you about. I issued news releases. I went online on social media and everywhere else. I told my list. I had an ad in Rolling Stone magazine in 2012. You know, world's first on one level. It was one of the most ballsy things to do <laughs> because strictly speaking, you can say there's a lot of self-help singer songwriters out there. They write music that inspires you, but none of them said it. None of them said it. And that is one of the keys to owning your marketplace, no matter who you are. You look at your story, you look at what you're doing, and if nobody else is actually saying it, but you're doing it, you can own it. You can put up your billboard. You can put up your business card, whatever it happens to be. I love it. Yeah, the question we always say is, is how can you be the only? Everyone talks about being a little better, a little bit different. <laughs> how can you be the only? We have an acronym we use here. But as soon as you were talking about world, and I think I got this from your book and P.T. Barnum, you know, whenever you can put worlds only, world record holder, anytime you put world in front of it, and I'll share with you what we did. This is inspired by you. When I released my book two years ago, I did a world tour, but I did it at Epcot. So I went from each country to each country until I got kicked out at Morocco and it got pictures and it created attention. It was a world book toward Epcot. And then now, Joe, in which I'll jump on this in a little bit with you, but we're becoming the only team to take the show on the road. So where every team is not playing their pandemic, we're taking the show on the road. People compare it to the Globe Charters, but there's no baseball teams. But instead, what we're trying to do, Joe, and we announced it, it's the one city world tour. This year, we're only going to one city. And so we make it into a big competition, the One City World Tour, and you go the opposite to try to create that buzz. And I think wow. the lesson is, how do you put world into it? How do you put the only? And it sounds like you've been doing that a lot with records, with saying you're the first. Is that a right. key here? It is a key here. And what I'm really admiring that you're doing, and I want to point it out so that everybody sees and hears it and gets it as a lesson, is that there is a sense of fun that is off the charts. And I really think this is the secret to making P.T. Barnum-like marketing work for any business right now, is that you have to take your creativity lid off. You have to pretend you're five years old. You have to pretend that anything is possible. You have to pretend that there are no rules, there's no boundaries. You have to pretend that just anything is possible. You know, a few years ago, I also got into strongman training. <laughs> and strongman training is when you take a horseshoe and you bend it, or you take a steel bar and you bend it, or you take a nail and you slam it through a board. And I did all this because I was fascinated as a kid by superhuman speeds of strength. And as time went on, I met some of these guys like Dennis Rogers and Iron Tamer Dave Whitley, and they personally taught me how to do these things. And then I thought, okay, I need to apply these to my work. And what it is, is I can go on stage and open. <laughs> I could even pass out the horseshoe because the horseshoe is built for a horse. You know, it's built to hold a 2,000 pound animal. And once somebody has held it, and I say with mind power and muscle and some technique, I'm going to freaking open it. I have something that separates me from all the other speakers out there. Then, because I'm an author, I wrote a book called Anything is Possible The Seven Lessons I Learned from Bending Horseshoes and Nails and Screws and, you know, on and on and on. So, I think thinking out of the box, I don't drink anymore, but I got to tell you, when I was, some of the best ideas came <laughs> when you are just silly. Yeah. You're just silly. And you don't have to drink to be silly. You just have to have fun. You have to be with somebody 
that is willing to go there with you. What I mean by that is to not judge ideas. Maybe that's a big takeaway. There was a couple of people, friends of mine in Australia, and they were having wine one night, and they were talking about palm reading. And one of them saw a cat walk by, and they said, well, you know, we need a palm reading book for cats. And they ended up writing a book called Paw Mystery. So it's about <laughs> your cat's paw, and it became a bestseller. And the whole reason to bring this up is this is the kind of thinking we want to bring to our business. We want to have this fun. We want to have a non-judgmental room for letting ideas go. I don't care how crazy they are. I've been able to meet several billionaires at this point. I remember one billionaire saying, if you walk into a party and you tell somebody what your idea is and they don't think you're crazy, you haven't thought big enough. You I haven't know. thought big enough. So all of this is in the direction of stretching the mind. And it's one of the things I see you doing and so admire about you is that you're having fun. And that fun is translating into money in the marketplace. And that's the takeaway for everybody. Well, well, thank you. And I think this is something, again, we're talking about two areas that they don't have hundreds of business books on. Attention and fun. Because they're like, well, how do you teach it? And I think what you just made, I love the quote from P.T. Barnum. It's, people will spend their last nickel to have fun. Right. And then he also said, I'd rather be laughed at than not noticed at all, which you shared right. in your book. And I right. think it's so important to think about that. How can you have fun and actually make that a business strategy? Well, that's where some brainstorming comes in, but it has to be that playful brainstorming. Yes. You know, you almost have to go somewhere and read comic books or hang around with kids. And maybe hanging around with kids, you know, three-year-olds, five-year-olds that are playing with nothing. Yes. You know, they don't need to have technology. You yes. can throw a piece of string on the floor and they're going to turn it into something. And they're going to have fun with it. And you are correct. P.T. Barnum didn't say the phrase, there's a customer born every minute. That was actually said by a competitor. But because he knew it was getting attention and people gave it to him and credited it to him, if you want to use that word. He didn't defend himself. He didn't change it because in his opinion, and Houdini thought a lot of this too, is that all the publicity was good. It was all getting his name out there. So as long as his name was out there, it was good. And you know, other people like Edison, there was some sort of movie I saw recently where it was about Edison. That guy was a P.T. Barnum. I mean, if you think about all the, all the ways he put his name on everything, <laughs> even things like the light bulb, which he didn't invent. He invented an element that allowed it to burn longer, but he didn't invent the light bulb. He was glad to take credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> he was glad to have our error in attribution go to him. So whether it's Edison, whether it's Barnum, whether it's Evil Knievel, whether it's Houdini, whether it's you, these people know that they have to do something and in many ways be something that is attention getting. And before we go too far, I need to point this out because I don't know the nature of your audience, but I've been talking about Barnum. My book came out, I think, in 98, and it was reissued in 2006. So I've been doing this for a long time. But there's a lot of people who consider themselves to be introverts. And so they don't want to wear a yellow tuxedo, let alone, they don't even want to put on the underwear, <laughs> you know, because they'll know they've got the underwear on. And so we have to look at that. When I talk about being outrageous and I talk about being attention getting, it doesn't have to be lighting yourself on fire. It can be simple. Because of my notoriety and being in the self-help world because of the movie The Secret, I wore beads. And I don't even remember why I was wearing beads the day I was filmed, but I wore beads. I've become the bead guy. I have to wear beads. It's part of my branding these days. When I went on Larry King the first time, I didn't have my beads on. And people said, where are your beads? <laughs> so in many ways, I'm an introvert. I'm kind of an amp ampivert. I kind of go both ways. I don't want to be on stage all the time. I'd rather be with my books. Look what's behind me. I'm an author. I want to write. I want to live with my friends, all these dead people. I can enjoy being with them. So I want to make sure that your audience who might be on the introverted side and feeling bashful about trying to put on a yellow suit can do other things. Or, of course, they can hire somebody to do it for them. There's all kinds of ways around this. Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. What if you're an introvert? What if you're an introvert? I get asked that constantly. And, and we have introverts a part of our team, but we understand as a business, 
We need to stay relevant by being remarkable and by creating unforgettable experiences. And if we're not doing that, our business cannot be an introvert. And I think there's a completely different mindset. They say, our business is an introvert. Well, good luck. I'm sure there's plenty of successful companies that are introverts for business sense. But we have to continue to get out there and ask that question, why should people care? And you may have shared this in your book, but think like a reporter. I'm always thinking that way. You know, when you talk about feed the monster and create attention, you got to give something that's noteworthy, that's newsworthy, that people want to talk about. And so when you're working with businesses and companies, and I know you've done a lot of speaking, how have companies been able to build this mindset and not only like to everyone to think, is this remarkable and how to make something remarkable? Have you maybe some examples of companies that started implementing these ideas, these outrageous ideas? Well, I'll tell you what helps all the companies is the same thing that helped me. And it was reading stories of people who have already done it because the stories inspire you and the stories instruct you. I still remember way back in the 1990s when I was learning about marketing and I was learning about getting publicity and getting attention that I would hear speakers like Jay Abraham is a pretty well-known marketing consultant. He's still around. He's a brilliant man. And he would talk about going into a gym and he'd look around and he'd see like 30 different ways that could promote the business. And I'd sit there going, how do you think like that? How are you getting these ideas? Because I would walk into a gym and just go, well, I've got to work out. I didn't see anything. But because I listened to stories like that, my brain was trained to start to think that way. So one of the first things I say, and it sounds self-serving, but I say, go get my book. There's a customer born every minute is full of stories. And they're not just P.T. Barnum stories. There's Houdini stories in there. There's stories about different companies, small companies, big companies, including some of myself. I'm proud of the book, but it's because of all the stories in the book. Yeah. It's not because of me. And so reading these stories, listening to these stories, looking at the films that you have, your documentary and things like that about what you've done, they teach people how to think differently. And that, I think, is the big takeaway, is that you have to stretch your mind to begin it to think. It's almost like learning a new language. You have to start thinking in that new language. You have to start thinking in terms of what are the ways I can be silly? What are the ways I can have fun? And maybe they're just a secret to yourself. You don't have to tell anybody right now. But because you're having fun with it and you're being silly and you're being ridiculous, you start to conjure up ideas. There's some tried and true ones. I mean, P.T. Barnum did baby contest way back in the 1800s. Contests are still big today in every way, shape, or form. What was a baby contest? What was the baby contest? I'm sure it was for the most adorable baby. <laughs> I'd go the obvious. I'd go the obvious. I'd say the ugliest, ugly baby contest. <laughs> but see, that's another example. So you take what's already been done before and then you reverse it like you just did. Yeah. You can do the same thing with a dog contest. Let me see who is the most pretty dog. You're going to do the same thing and go, what is the homeliest looking dog, yeah, yeah, yeah. homeliest looking cat, homeliest looking parakeet? You can have contest in every way, shape, or form. In the book I talk, I think I did in the Barnum book, on people like Bill Phillips, who did the Body for Life challenge way back at the turn of the century, I think, 2000 and 2001. And my God, it seemed like he was everywhere. The guy was everywhere. His book was everywhere. His magazine was everywhere. And of course, he was challenging people to change their bodies in 12 weeks using his methodology. And whoever changed the most dramatically was going to win. I think at the time it was a Ferrari. There was some expensive sports car. And the only stipulation was you had to use his product. Otherwise, everything was free game. This is the kind of thing we want to think in terms of what could be a challenge? What could be a contest? What could be a survey? Surveys are very simple things to do. But if you're clever about the survey, okay, I got to tell you a quick story. <laughs> this is so cool. You know, you and I never talked before. I didn't know the nature of where we would go with this conversation. And I'm having a blast because it's so much of an adrenaline fun ride to think out of the box, to just have fun. When my Barnum book came out, I wanted to do something Barnum-like to promote it, right? Doesn't it make sense? And yet I'm kind of introverted. It's like, I don't really want to put on a yellow suit and a yellow hat and all that. Maybe the underwear is okay. And I talked to one of the hoaxers who's now dead. He was mentioned in the book, Alan Abel. And Alan Abel suggested that I have a canine concert. And a canine concert is a dog concert. It's dog singing. <laughs> it's already nuts, right? But hear me out. So the very first thing I had to do was find out, well, what kind of music do the canines like? 
So I sent a survey out to my list, which I also sent to the media at the time. This is in the early internet days. And I said, I'm trying to find out what kind of music your dog likes. <laughs> rock and roll, opera, classical folk. And anyway, it came back rock and roll. So I then sent out a news release saying, overwhelming, in the Austin, Texas area, all the animals want rock and roll music. So I'm going to have a rock and roll canine concert. And I selected a date, and then I looked for a band, and there was a band called Porter Davis, who was smart enough to know they're not getting any money, but they're going to get publicity, which will lead to money. So they volunteered to perform. And I said, it's real easy. You play one real song live for all the people who are bringing their dogs, and then all the other songs you pretend to play because we'll say it's going through our sound systems at a level only dogs can hear. It's like the dog whistle kind of thing. Only the dog can hear the dog whistle. Well, we're going to play rock and roll music for the animals at a sound level only they can hear. Then I sent out a news release to the media. We had four news crews show up. We had a bunch of people at a dog park with all their dogs there. And we had the MC was a guy who played P.T. Barnum in the theater. And he wanted to do it. He had read my book and he knew about it. So he volunteered to do it. Then I had a magician who was also a friend of mine who said, well, I have a giant book, but that is where you can produce something. He says, it's a life-size book. You can put somebody in it. And I said, well, can we find somebody to be a mermaid? Because P.T. Barnum PG mermaid. showed a mermaid at his event. So I got a magician to get his book trick, and we put my book cover on the front of the book. So no matter what news crew is filming it, no matter what person is looking at the stage, no matter who's doing what, and when I came up there to make a little short announcement, I'm standing right in front of my P.T. Barnum book. There's a customer born every minute. And then when we produce The Mermaid, who's this gorgeous redhead, we open up my book, and she steps out. And so it was all for fun. At first, when the media was there, they interviewed everybody as if it was dead serious. It's like, you're really playing this for the dogs? And I'm like, yep, this is only for the dogs. By the end of it, they knew that it was all a joke. And one of them came up and said, why did you do this? And I said, I was trying to sell my book. <laughs> <laughs> and it became a great story, and the book sold. It became a great story and the book sold. And we still have footage of it. I think it's on YouTube. Plus, I got a DVD out of it that I sold for a while. I have to find out where that went. I was going to put it on Amazon or something. You sold the place. DVD to the concert? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. To the, to the concert. Yeah. And there's so many wins. Everybody still talks about the event. Porter Davis, which was the band who played, become best friends of mine. In fact, their lead singer was the guy who ended up producing my albums. Wow. My singer-songwriter album. The magician's still my best friend. We've done several things together. I mean, this is another reason I'm pointing out the stories, is that this is about not only getting business for yourself and not only entertaining the public in the way that you're doing this, but there's win-win-wins, which is my favorite thing to look for in business. The people are happy. They're entertained. You are happy. You got educated. You got some publicity. Hopefully, you got sales and increase in business, or you got something that you can, like a story that you get mileage from. That all happened, God, in the last century. I'm still talking about it, you know, 20 years later. And, and that's the key. It's to have the courage to do something that you don't know how it's going to happen, how it's going to work. And the worst case scenario is you'll get a great story. And I've told the story about our grandma beauty pageant that went crazy. I've told the stories about our salute to underwear nights, our flatulence fun nights. And this show will air after we've already done it. But you know, we were having generic Christmas parties, Joe, like at the ballpark, and we had ugly Christmas sweaters. I said, this is too normal. So let's do something different. So last year, we did a secret game called our Fans Giving Game. And we did it for fans. We actually had fans dress up as pilgrim costumes. We had to throw out the first rock. It was Plymouth Rock. And we said, all right, we take it to another level. This year, what we did is we said, all right, let's really pay tribute to Thanksgiving and what it's about. There were 66 pilgrims that made the journey to our country Let's actually starve our fans for the first 66 minutes in our ballpark. So literally let them in, and they're only going to get rations. We're going to throw out bread rations, corn rations. to have a joyous feast at the 66 minute. And we're going to bury a turkey in the infield dirt and let fans win a whole turkey dinner and take it to a whole other level because that's how you build on something. You test it, you experiment, and you're like, all right, canine concert. Well, we could do this. Oh, now we could do this. Now we could do this. And then it becomes a story and a success. 
And I think it's getting people to have the courage. P.T. Barnum had the courage to do something where he had no idea what he was going to do. And I think one point I want to jump on, when he took the show on the road, you shared how, I'd say show on the road, when he took, started the circus, all his people that worked with him said, this isn't going to work. It's going to be too expensive. And he's like, we're going to do it. Can you share that story? Because we're getting ready to do that and no one thinks it's going to work. And I'm fascinated by it. Well, I have to think back to the story. I got to remember, I wrote the book in 98. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I still love it. I've reread it a couple of times going, man, there's some great stuff in here. It's a nice <laughs> reminder to me. But as I remind it, the circuses back then were just going town to town and taking their train or their wagon train, so to speak. Yes. It's a long, hard road to do it that way. But the railroads were coming into being and the railroads were joining the country. They were joining the city. And P.T. Barnum said, I'm going to put it on the railroad. And people said, you can't do that. You can't transport your animals. You can't transport all the equipment you need, the people you need, the tents you need, and all that kind of stuff. And Barnum was like, yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> There's actually a line in his autobiography that I never forgot because he said he actually entertained the idea of building a railroad to the moon. And he would often say it in terms of it's impossible, but it was also his unlimited thinking in terms of how can we make it possible? How can we build a railroad to the moon? And this is a guy in the 1800s saying this. Not a guy today. It's this a is a guy in the 1800s. And so putting it on the train, he just thought, we're going to make it happen. And of course, he did. And you know, what, what happened was interesting. I read, I think it might have been an extra biography about him. But the first time they went on the road in the trains, it took almost three to four times longer because they had to figure out how to get everything in the trains, everything out. But then the next time, they got yeah. better. And then the next time it became exponentially faster. And it makes me think about the first time we tried to serve our entire stadium all you can eat food. It was a disaster the first game. We had no idea how to feed 10,000 pieces of meat in an hour. And people <laughs> were waiting forever. But then each night got better. And I think so many people are afraid to get past that first challenge. P.T. Barnum's, all of his employees could have said, see, it didn't work. But he said, you know what? It is a better experience if we actually push through. And I think that's what you've done and what P.T. Barnum done. And it's just a lesson that we all need to think about. You're bringing up a good point. I think one of the lessons, and I had to learn this with songwriting too, is be willing to suck. Be willing to fail. Because that failure is actually feedback. I actually say there's no such thing as failure. All it is is feedback. You try to go in one direction and you got something that happened, which gave you information which you take that information and maybe you refine what you're going for, you refine your direction. Or there's a whole new product, or a whole new service that comes because of the feedback you came, you got. So there isn't any failure, it's all feedback. So if you have the mindset that anything goes, we're gonna try it all, it's okay if you fail, because as you say, there's a story there. Or as I say, there's a learning there that can lead to the next thing. And as you keep growing and as you keep refining, much like Barnum with the railroad there, you keep tweaking everything. You find shortcuts. Somebody there working for you will find a hack. I think it was Steve Jobs or Bill Gates that said, I give the hardest jobs to the laziest person in the room because I know they're going to find the shortcut. They're going to find the easy way to get it done. And so we want to think like that. But being willing to fail, being willing to suck, these are important ingredients. Well, it's innovate first, then that gets to iteration. And then failure equals right. discovery, failure equals feedback. But, you know, it don't just be in a world of just slightly iteration. Be in a world of innovation and lead to iteration. You know, I got to make this a little different podcast too. So we're going to have a game, Joe. All right, we're not just going to keep it normal. That wouldn't be PT Barnum-esque, okay? <laughs> all right, so, let's go for it. All right, so we're going to do a game here, all right? It's truth and dare. Truth Which and one would you like first? Lay it on me. I don't care. Truth. All right, all right we'll go truth first, all right? So truth. What is something that maybe you and P.T. Barnum share that has potentially held you both back, back when he was living, from success? You know, it sounds like P.T. did everything right, and you, you, know, you obviously built so much success. What is something that's held either you or him back that you may have that ties each other? What an interesting question. You know, the question is seeking a negative answer I don't normally allow my brain to go to. All right, I don't want, okay, okay. No, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with it, though, because I said truth. This is an interesting answer to an interesting question. I would say our love for magic. I am a lifetime member of the Society of American Magicians. I talked about Houdini in the beginning. I actually wanted to be Harry Excello. I had my own name. My brothers tie me up when I was a kid, and then I'd wrestle myself out of it. I was going to be tied up and thrown off a bridge at one point when I was a kid. I actually looked at the bridge and looked at the water, thought about it. <laughs> 
And I think that probably wasn't my life path. That probably wasn't it. P.T. Barnum was a magician too. He was into magic. He was into hypnotism. As far as I know, on some of his cruise ships, he did a little bit of sleight of hand magic, but I don't know that he spent a lot of time with it that I can think of. So I don't know. That's my answer. It's interesting. I've asked that question a lot because it gets people to look that way, but you're right. I don't like negativity in my life at all. That can be perceived as negative. At the end of each night, my wife and I do a rose, rose, bud. A rose is something great from the day, and a bud is something we're looking forward to. We got it from Neil Pashrika, but he does rose, rose, thorn, bud. And a thorn is something negative from the day. We won't touch that. We don't even want to go Good there because Good keep the you. positive mindset. So, right. all right, you're not getting away from the dare. So you ready for this? All right, give me a dare. All right, so the dare, this is a game we do at a ballpark. We got 2,000 fans in one grandstand versus 2,000 fans in another grandstand. It is called the sing-off. And what happens is a song plays. When the song stops, they got to finish that song lyric. So you are the only contestant in the sing-off. And so you do have your 15 albums. So we're going to play a song. When the song stops, you need to finish that song lyric. You ready, Joe? Yeah, bring it on. All right, here we go. Tell me, do you want to go? This is the night. This is the day. This is your moment. This is forever. Right now, right here, right this minute. Now or never. Okay. All right. So oh, this is the greatest show. I like it. So did you make it your own lyrics? I just made up my own lyrics there. <laughs> Joe, that is amazing. I both feel they just finished the song lyrics. You actually turned it into your own. You knew it was This is the Greatest Show. I did once we got into it, yes. Oh. All right. You have won all of the dares. You have won it on over 100 guests right there. What did I, I already got my underwear. What else is there? A hat? Very well done. Very well done. All right. This is great. We talked about attention. We talked about fun. We sang, taking chances. I want to go to the ninth inning here with a few little bit of rapid fire. Standing out in sports, I don't know if you ever put this perspective, but for instance, baseball, long, slow, boring, challenge, attendance declining dramatically. We're trying to make it all about the show. If you were in my shoes, owning a crazy team like the Savannah Bananas, what are some things you or P.T. Barnum you think would think about doing? When we were talking about music, I would have a song. There needs to be some sort of catchy, lyrical, upbeat, maybe inspiring song that people could sing, and they would want to sing. They would want to go to the ballpark to hear that song and sing that song. And if your team can actually be choreographed to do some sort of dance routine as they sing the song, you would end up with a video, of course, of some sort. That's one of the things I think is a takeaway is having music. Music is memorable. Music is emotional. If you do the right song, the right lyrics, the right message, they will remember you forever because of that. So yeah. I would say that is one of the first things to do right there. We've done music videos, but not like Old Town Road, Can't Stop the Peeling, which have got millions of views, lots of views, but nothing that is actually an individual song that people could, I mean, could a sports team have a song that's a top 40 hit? Why not? Why not is right. I love that question. Why not? Yeah. Why not? All right. I love that. We have a banana pep band, but I think we need some real singers. You got me thinking. I love that. All right. I've been grilling you for a little bit. This is flip the script. So now you're going to be the host of Business Done Differently. You can ask me one question. Oh, I can ask you one question. Yes. Turn All right. Well, I'm going to turn the, the... You've read my book on Barnum. You've been interviewing me for 45 minutes or so. <laughs> I told you I'm a singer-songwriter. I'm the world's first self-help singer-songwriter. What do you think I could do to get my music and me noted in an even bigger planetary way? Wow. Um, Ten, nine, I, I eight, see you, Joe. Seven. I'll be quick. I see you because you're obviously an older person who's generated a lot of success. But where could someone like you be in a different realm? I could see you on TikTok actually doing fun, upbeat, like showing your stuff in TikTok because not many people like you are doing that on that TikTok. So how would you get the music? Like this guy is fun. He's different. He's not like everyone else. Instead of going like the way everyone else is going, I would go that young audience. TikTok has taken off for us because we're just showing baseball. We're showing the fun. That would be my idea. That is a great idea. And I would be like P.T. Barnum. If you just told P.T. Barnum that, he and I would say the same thing. We'd go, what's TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> are you actually asking? I am asking, yes. All right. I can look it up. No, TikTok is the newest social media platform, as big as Instagram, very big as Facebook. I mean, it's taking off millions of millions. Up. It's all for like, starts off okay. young. 
you know, 14 to 20 to 25 and it's, and then it ages up. So it's all about dances and singing. So that's where I put you. <laughs> we just got on it six months ago. So I'm learning too. All right. We'll finish here. Question time. Uh, a few more here. If, if you want better answers in business, you got to ask better questions. You know, PT Barnum asked a lot of questions. He was constantly curious. Same thing as you. What are some of the best questions you're asking? Ah, uh-huh. I have a couple bottom line beliefs that probably lead to good questions. One of them is anything is possible. Well, it's the title of one of my books, but there's a bottom line belief that anything is possible. I was homeless once. I was in poverty for a very long time. During those stretches, I didn't believe anything was possible. So it takes a whole different mindset. And when you think anything is possible, questions come up like, what do you want? If anything is possible, what do you want in your life, in your business, in your relationships, finances, anything like that? Just take the lid off and ask, what would you like? The question that I like to follow up from that is, what would be better than that? So if we come back and say, okay, anything is possible. I would like to increase my business by, I don't know, 30% in six months. What would be better than that? Well, obviously, increasing it by 50% in three months, you know? So asking questions that lead to the tearing down of limits, I think is the direction to go in. And it's one of my favorite things to do. I wrote another book called Zero Limits, and it's kind of the mindset I always remind myself of. If I really thought in terms of zero limits, what would I do right now? So I would invite people to consider that. If you thought there are no limits, there's no boundaries, anything is possible, what would you go for? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a juicy thing to end on right there. Yeah. No oh. limits, no boundaries, nothing stopping you. What would you go for? I mean, I'm kind of tickled to think about it. But now we're going to give an encore. So that's going to be the great, the great ending now an encore. But I love that because I'm actually picturing putting anything as possible on our whiteboard and say, all right, let's start writing things, guys. Let's start thinking. I love it. Maybe. Yeah. All right. A few more quick ones. It's showtime. Someone leaves this, this call podcast right now. What's something they could do to channel the inner Joe Vitale, the inner PT Barnum? Right now, what could they do with their team, their business? Oh, I would walk in and find out, or I would invite everybody to come up with some sort of fun game, song, strategy, contest, survey, anything along those lines or more things I'm not even thinking of right now to engage the public. What can we do that's fun to engage the public relevant to what we do in business. I love it. You had 10 ways to grab attention from hold the contest, hire a band, use costume characters, hold psychic greetings, bring in animals, offer collectibles, art show, sponsor an event, hire an entertainer, break a record. There's so many out there. Just start doing. All right, final two here. This is gonna be a crazy question never been asked before. What does going bananas mean to you? Going bananas, that is just being a a silly three-year-old who has been let loose in a room after having a a lot of sugar. <laughs> Good. I'm going to challenge business owners to get in that mindset once in a while because you never know what's going to happen there. And by the way, what do you think makes someone unforgettable? Unforgettable? I'll tell you, Benjamin Franklin said it. Benjamin Franklin said, do things worth writing or write things worth reading. You'll be unforgettable, much like him. Ah, that's so brilliant. So brilliant. I love this one quote that Barnum shared with Mark Twain that you share in your book. I think it is conceded that I generally do pretty big things as a manager, am audacious in my outlays and risk, and give much for little money, and make my shows worthy of the support of the moral and refined classes. I think uh, from the 1800 terms, that says it all. And I think you have done that. You give more than what you're asked for. You take big risks. You challenge yourself. And you're constantly you know, thinking about how do you give the most for your customer. And uh, you've given so much today, Joe. You've given so much to me over the past 15 years. You don't even know it, my friend. And I am just so <laughs> grateful for having you with us today and considering you a friend. Thank you, Jesse. I applaud what you're doing. As I was telling you before we started the interview, it's very gratifying to me as an author to see somebody take what I've written about and run with it. And you've done that in a way that, you know, the ghost of P.T. Barnum is smiling on you. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much, Joe. Appreciate you so much. Thank you for listening to Business Done Differently, where we believe that challenging the status quo, creating fans first, and changing the game is the best way to grow your business. For more information about the guest and topics covered in this episode, visit findyouryellowtux.com or shoot me a note at jesse at findyouryellowtux.com. Until next time, stop standing still, start standing out.